Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker, along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston. We are seeking not only to help you know deep, solid biblical theology, but to know the Word of God and the promises of God that are given to us in His Word, all while holding to solid theological truths in your heart, soul, and mind. And here at Kitchen Table Theology, we're grateful for our friends at Columbia International University. For 100 years, CIU has been educating people from a biblical worldview to impact the nations with the message of Christ. They offer undergraduate, graduate, and seminary programs, both on campus and online programs designed specifically for working adults. With small class sizes and a world-class faculty, there are endless possibilities for your growth at CIU. So we encourage you to check all of that out today at CIU. Edu. And hello again, Kitchen Table Theologians. Thanks for joining us. And today, Tiff, we take a look into the Old Testament book of First Samuel. And this is one of those Old Testament books that contains so yeah. much. It's fairly lengthy as well. It has 31 chapters, and it tells us a lot about Samuel, Saul and David, three very powerful men and that we probably have maybe all heard of that God brought onto the scene to lead his people. Of course, there's pretty some pretty incredible stories along the way, but why don't we begin with a brief overview? What do we see when we first come to this book? Yeah, I love this book. I've just, um, in my own personal like devotional time for the last month or so, I've been reading through First Samuel as my reading plan takes me through and it, 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 wow, it's just got so many cool stories. And the book begins with the story of Hannah and Eli as the main characters. And Hannah had longed to have children, but was unable to. And uh, you may remember this, she's praying one day, apparently praying silently, but moving her lips, as I'm sure you and I have done many times. So Eli, the priest, observes her and thought she was drunk, and he confronted her about it. But of course, she wasn't intoxicated. And she said, I am a woman oppressed, she said, oppressed in spirit, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. So I'm not drunk. I'm oppressed in spirit, and I'm just crying out to God. And Eli took all that on board and said a blessing over her. And not long after that, her son, Samuel, was born. And then the story kind of takes off with Samuel. Uh, that story of Hannah is just such an introductory part, I think, but it's so short. It's just yeah. in the first chapter there, but there's so much that we can learn from her. She came to the Lord in prayer. She brought her heartache, her sorrow, her desire to have a son. And what I love about Hannah is she believed that he would answer her. Like she went back home, smile on her face, made dinner, whatever was next in her day. She truly trusted that he would be faithful in answering her. And that's always encouraging to me when I pray, believe that God is going to answer this prayer. Yeah. God did answer her, gave him a son. She named him Samuel, which I know you love name meanings. Mm -hmm. This is a cool one. Samuel means God has heard, which just totally reflects in the story there. Yeah. So love that. And then Samuel ends up playing a huge role in the Israelite story. Absolutely, he does. God uses Samuel to begin the role of kings in the nation of Israel. Okay, so back to our overview. We we see God in this book raise up two kings, one quite proud, the other quite humble. And it's just an exciting book. And it's, as you said, it's pretty lengthy, but it's split into two parts as you're reading through it. And the first part is a contrasting character study between Saul and David. And it's really showing the importance of humility in, in the people of God. Three characters throughout the book are highlighted, and, and that's Samuel, Saul, and David. And there are major themes in the book just overall. You, you can read about God's antagonism toward arrogant people. You see the joy that comes into the lives of humble people. You read about loyalty to God in the face of evil. You will find throughout the promise of a messianic king. These themes are explored as throughout the book, Saul 
becomes king. He ascends to prominence only to have his weaknesses exposed when he disobeys something God told him to do. And in contrast, along comes David. God exalts David, a younger, faithful, pious shepherd who had a very strong faith in God. And these two personalities become more and more contrasting as the story goes on. And Saul slips into madness as David resolutely trusts in God's timing and purpose for his life. There's so much for us to dive into there, <laughs> into that, all of that, but the characters, their faith, their personalities, all of that, and all of these themes. But let's maybe start a little bit more basic. Who was the author? When was it written? And then I have another question too. Why is there a first and second Samuel? Do they simply just divide the book because it would have been incredibly long? <laughs> or is it is there something more specific to it? Yeah, here's where it gets interesting. We'll start with your later question first, why there are two. In the earliest Hebrew manuscripts, First and Second Samuel were treated as a single book. And of course, it would have been a long book, but it wouldn't have right. been war and peace. That wouldn't have been that long. <laughs> and then later, the translators of the Greek Septuagint, the Latin Vulgate, some English translations, and some more modern Hebrew Bibles, they eventually separated First and Second Samuel into two books. The one book was given the name Samuel. When it, in the oldest manuscripts in Hebrew, when it was just one book, it was given the name Samuel. And most people believe that was because it was Samuel whom God used to establish the kingship in Israel. Without Samuel, you don't have the later stories. English translations, later Hebrew manuscripts refer to the divided book as first and second Samuel, as do we. The Septuagint referred to them as the first and second books of kingdoms, not of Samuel, of kingdoms, and the Vulgate as first and second kings. And our first and second kings were called third and fourth kings. I guarantee okay. you I have confused everybody with, with all of that. No, I think we got it. But who wrote the book? Yeah, let's move away from all that. Wait. Okay, still interesting as we get to that question. So based on First Chronicles 29, 29, Jewish tradition attributes our first and second Samuel to either Samuel or Samuel, Nathan, and Gad. And Tiff, would you mind reading those verses for us out of First Chronicles 29? Sure. All the events of King David's reign from beginning to end are written in the record of Samuel the seer, the record of Nathan the prophet, and the record of Gad the seer. These accounts include the mighty deeds of his reign and everything that happened to him and to Israel and to all the surrounding kingdoms. Okay, before you go on, I have to ask what a seer is. I, th I think we all get what a prophet is, but I'm guessing for maybe some of us here at Kitchen Table Theology, a seer See, yeah. is a term that we're not too familiar with. And it, it's, that's a really good point. It's spelled S-E-R. It, it's, it's a word we hardly ever see. Use, <laughs> did you see right. what I, see. Did you see what I did there? <laughs> nice. And okay, so what is a seer? So without trying to sound like a smart aleck, a seer is one who sees. So let me explain okay. before you throw Southern Pecan coffee on me. <laughs> In the Bible, a seer is another name for a prophet, but it was a special kind of prophet. Specifically, a seer was a prophet who saw visions. So Pictures are scenes seen in the mind's eye or in dreams, or even in some cases with one's natural eye. God spoke to his people through prophets in different ways, and one way was through visions. So along with the ability to see visions, a seer was also given insight into what God was saying by those visions for his people. Seers or prophets were prophets who had the ability to see visions, and God would give them the gift of interpreting those visions for his people. 
That is so interesting. And I think I maybe f- forgot where we were headed with all of this. <laughs> I read that verse for a reason. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and then I got us distracted. Sorry. You said that Dr- Jewish tradition attributes first oh, and second yeah. Samuel to either Samuel as the author or Samuel, Nathan, and Gad, which we read First Chronicles 29. Right. So back okay. to that. We're on yeah, We're the author. on authorship. Nathan and Gad, the seers, were two men we meet in these books. So Samuel cannot have written it because in 1 Samuel 25, we read about his death and before any of the events connected to David's reign. So he wasn't even around for that. Additionally, Gad and Nathan were living prophets of the Lord throughout David's time on earth. So they weren't around when the first portion of the book was written. Basically, the author of First and Second Samuel is unknown, but it's probable that portions of the writings of all three of these prophets inspired whoever pulled them together, I guess we could say. So the writing is presented to us as readers anonymously, meaning that whoever the human author was speaks for the Lord and gives the divine interpretation of the events that are narrated for us and to us in the book. It's true. I learn something new every day. (laughs) I think I might speak for most of us here at Kitchen Table Theology when I say I probably all of my life have assumed that Samuel wrote these books because his name is attached. Yeah, and I think his name, again, got attached because he was the man God used to establish kingly rule in, in Israel. All right, so we don't exactly know who the author or authors were, but you've given us some great background on that. Do you know when it was written? Yeah, that was a little bit easier. And just for the sake of time, it was written likely between 931 and 722 BC. So roughly 700 to 900 years before Christ came to earth. So I did a little math. And by comparison for you and I, here we are living in 2023. What does that look like seven to 900 years ago? So that would put it in our minds and in our life, around 11 to 1300 AD. So however long that feels to us ago, which it feels a long, long, long time. That's about how it was compared to when it was written, compared to when Christ came. So seven to 900 years. Great. All right. With all of that in mind, then all of our background complete, let's dive into some of our theological themes that we can find in 1 Samuel. We can start with the importance of staying faithful and true to the Lord God Almighty. Canaanite religion, so the Israelites are in the promised land, right? But they Canaanite religion, false gods surrounded them, tried to infiltrate the Israelites when they entered the promised land. We read about that in 1 Samuel. We're introduced to Baal or Baals, the, the chief god of the Canaanites, essentially a fertility god. There was Dagon, the fish slash grain god, of the Philistines. This false god, Dagon, he's mentioned 11 times in the book. Astartes was a Canaanite fertility goddess. We read about her. And in Hebrew, this is very interesting. Her her Canaanite name was Astartes or Astartes. But in Hebrew, they deliberately misspelled that name to be pronounced Ashtoreth. And they use the vowels of the Hebrew word in there, which equate to shame, which I think is really interesting. So they were recognizing her as a false god, shameful, and they did a play on her name to to read that way. We read about mediums. We read about animism, the worship of inanimate objects like stones and trees and high places. And unfortunately, we don't find Israel always staying true to God. So that that's a really big theological theme, staying faithful to God throughout the book. Right, which is hard to do when you are completely surrounded by all of these false gods, the importance of staying faithful and true to God. What other theological themes can we find in 1 Samuel? Numbers. Numbers. Now, not the book of, not the book of Numbers, but two specific numbers, the number seven and the number three. Some people really go off on biblical numbers 
and get into numerology and they read all sorts of significance into numbers which do not exist. But in 1 Samuel, we see the numbers 7 and 3 playing a really important role. I think we've all heard seven is the perfect number. I've always thought three is a pretty important number in the Bible. It represents the Trinity. So yeah, seven and three, those numbers. And you're certainly not wrong. So let's look at seven. There are significant sevens in both Samuel books. For example, Hannah, you know, the story you love so well at the beginning of the book, she refers to herself as a mother of seven. The Ark of the Covenant is stolen by the Philistines, and things eventually got so bad for them, they gave it back. (laughs) But the Ark of the Covenant is in Philistia for seven months. Saul obediently waits for Samuel seven days before his disobedience. The elders of Jabesh ask for seven days of respite before they surrender. Seven of Jesse's sons pass before Samuel before David is chosen. The town or the village of Jabesh Gilead fast for seven days after Saul died. David rules Judah in Hebron seven years and and six months, and seven of Saul's sons are executed. Wow, that was a lot of examples just in this book. (laughs) Yeah, that covers both of the books, but I think almost all of those are in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, yeah. And looking at your references, I think only one was from 2 Samuel. So that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And there's even more when you add a zero to the seven and look for the number 70, that popping up every now and again, too. Wow. All right. You also said the number three. Tell us about that one. Yeah. The number three is unusually prominent in Samuel. And it appears, can you believe this? It appears more than 45 times. Wow. And it it often symbolizes totality, wholeness, or completeness as it does in other biblical settings. I I think the most important use of the number three are in regard to Hannah gives birth to three sons after being barren all of her life. There were three men who met Saul after his anointing, and they came with three children and three loaves of bread. David hides from Saul for three days. Jonathan shoots three arrows as a signal. David bows to Jonathan three times. An Egyptian brought to David had not eaten for three days and three nights. Three of Saul's four sons die. The three champions of are in, in David's troops. There's three soldiers listed kind of as three that rose above all the other soldiers. There's only three of them. There's a famine in the book. It, guess how long it lasts? Three years. Um, God makes offers to David. Guess how many offers God made to David? Three. Three choices, each with a duration of either three years, three months, or three days. So three's everywhere. That's so interesting to me that it is just all throughout the book like that. Let's stick with the number three. You've given us two theological themes so far. How about we end the podcast with three themes? Here we go. Oh, that was a good one. That, I worked hard on that. You get me to shut up sooner this time. <laughs> okay, well. So I'll choose the theme of repentance. Uh, That's a great theological theme, repentance. The the books of Samuel have been interpreted as providing three models of repentance with Samuel, Saul, and David. In 1 Samuel 3, Samuel condemned the wicked priest at Shiloh, and following the return of the Ark of the Covenant, after the Philistines gave it back because it brought so much terrible circumstances to them, Samuel called upon the people to turn away from the gods of Canaan and turn back to God. So they confess sin, they repent from sin at a place called Mizpah, and God responded to their repentance by granting them victory and peace. Move ahead to chapter 15, Saul provides a negative example of repentance. Now, he says the words, I have sinned. And you would think he repented. But if you read past that, he offers excuses. He becomes defensive. He reveals his insincerity. And then after being confronted by Nathan the prophet, who condemned David for adultery, 
and Nathan promised that God would establish a Davidic dynasty, David repents. So Saul was a negative example of it. David's a positive example of it. David repents using the same words as Israel and as Saul, I have sinned, but without Saul's excuses. And David becomes an exemplary illustration of repentance. All right. I feel like today we heard a lot of history, a lot of background, a lot of numbers. So before we sign off of this episode, how about some application? What can we draw from 1 Samuel that we can apply to our lives today? Well, as we've said, there's so many, but let's just stick with David and Saul real quick, and then we'll wrap this up. Saul is a very tragic story, a study, and really he's a study in wasted opportunity. And here was a guy, he had it all. He had honor, authority, riches, good looks, power, fame, and more. And yet when he died in despair, he was terrified of his enemies. He knew he failed his nation, his family, and his God. And Saul made the mistake of thinking that a sensible motive will compensate for bad behavior. Now, if we can't apply that to our own lives, I don't know what we can apply. He made the mistake of thinking that a sensible motive will compensate for bad behavior. It won't. We don't know. Perhaps his power went to his head and he began to think he was above the rules. But somehow along the way, Saul developed a low opinion of God's commands and a very high opinion of himself. And even when he was confronted with his wrongdoing, he did his best to vindicate and justify himself. And that's when God rejected him and said, okay, the kingdom's going to go to David. So Saul's problem is one we all face, and it's a problem of the heart. And I guess a good takeaway for us could be obedience to God's will is necessary for success. And if we, in pride, rebel against him, we set ourselves up for loss. David, on the other hand, did not seem like much at first. Jesse trots his boys out to Samuel. One of these guys surely will be king. Well, and David's not in the lineup. And Samuel asked him, Don't, do you have any other sons? Yeah, I got this younger one. And he's out in the fields tending the sheep. So he didn't seem like much at first. And Samuel was even tempted to overlook him, but God sees the heart. And he saw in David a man after his own heart. That's a direct scripture verse in the book of Acts. The humility and integrity of David, in spite of his later shortcomings and sin, and you take that coupled with his boldness for the Lord and his commitment to prayer and his relationship to God, David really does set a good example for all of us. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much again for listening to Kitchen Table Theology. Listeners, if you would take just a moment to rate and review this podcast, especially on Spotify and iTunes, we would really appreciate it. It helps new listeners find the show, and we just want to spread the Kitchen Table Theology love. Don't forget, you can check out today's episode notes as well. As always, thanks to our spiritual home here at Low Country Community Church in Bluffton, South Carolina, for making this podcast possible. You can head on over to jeffcranston.com for more information about Dr. Cranston, his books, sermons, leadership notes, and blog posts. And Lord willing, next week, we'll be back with another great episode. We will dive into Paul's letter to the Galatians. So there it is. Now go deeper. And until next time, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.